This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. Subscribe to Bloomberg Surveillance On Demand on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And always on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Right now, Dana Peterson joins us chief economist at the conference board. To the heritage of the conference board, Dana, is there inflation that will affect corporations in this report or what your guesstimate is for tomorrow's PPI? Well, CEOs are already complaining about inflation. They're saying the cost of doing business is higher from wage uh, increases to uh, higher interest rates, all of it's really weighing on CEOs right now. So I think some of this probably will feed through to the CPI and the PCE over time. What will it do to Fed policy? I mean, it's an unfair question. Mike's only on page six of a 42-page report. But Dana Peterson, do you see enough of a movement here to adjust the parlor game of March and beyond to June? Well, we think that the Fed probably won't start cutting rates until around June. Um, and the key thing will be the, the course of inflation. The good news is that core inflation is still slowing, but the Fed also cares about the headline. And certainly when we look in the core, if home prices are still rising month on month, that doesn't bode well for year on year. But the good news is that we are seeing some cooling in wage inflation overall. And when you look at home prices, or at least the existing home prices year on year, they're slowing and that's showing up certainly in the rental components of both the CPI and the PCE. Dana, can we get a little bit more detail there? Just how high or low is the bar, do you think, to reduce interest rates at the Federal Reserve? And is it because you think it takes longer to get to that bar, or ultimately it's a bit higher than this market thinks it is? Well, I think I think the bar really is inflation, but it's also going to be the labor market. Does the labor market continue to cool? If you take away government, leisure and hospitality, and health care, you see no gains in employment. So once those three uh, industries run out of steam, what do you have? And also the economy in general, does the consumer stop spending and really slow? So I think if the economy slows a lot, labor market continues to slow, and inflation is headed back to the 2% target, the Fed will feel comfortable with cutting interest rates. But it may not be in March. It may be a little bit later this year, again, around mid-year. Is that when we'd expect to sit in jobless claims as well? Because, Dana, it's not just about CPI this morning. <clears throat> We've got jobless claims at 202, 202,000. It's just absolutely incredible. When would you expect to see that start to inflect higher? Sure. Well, the reason why initial jobless claims are so low is that our own data say that CEOs of large companies are not looking to let people go. They're hoarding workers, holding on to people. But certainly when <clears throat> people are let go, it's taking them longer to find a job. So uh, uh, continuing claims are ticking up a little and we do think that's going to show up more so in the unemployment rate. Are you modeling out a wage growth that sustains above inflation and so America sees a legitimate real wage growth? Well, it is possible that wages will uh, re remain above 2%. Um, certainly when we look at the gains over the last few years, yes, they were really outsized. Um, we are seeing slowing, but you do have some industries that wages are rising, certainly in construction, uh, in particular non-residential construction, where there's a lot of impetus to build infrastructure and factories at home due to industrial policies. So you could see wages settle out at a rate that's above 2%. I, mean, I looked, Dana, at the inflation data, and I want to go back to it. You know, this, John, this used to be religion 30, even 40 years ago. PPI was just as important as CPI. That all went away. But in tomorrow's PPI report, I know it's rejiggered. McKee's explained it to me three times. I flunked the quiz, the McKee quiz, three times. Dana, final business inflation, is it legitimate? Sure it is. Absolutely. It's everything that businesses are looking at. Um, and certainly that includes transportation costs, and, and um, which are a big thing, and also services which are quite material. So yeah. even though the PPI is different now than it was, you know, 10 years ago, it's still right. very relevant. 
This ties John directly into what Linda Dissel said at Federated. It's about margins. And yeah. If you've got that inflation input down the income statement, what does it do? Now, forget about Apple and all that. It's a real American a company. I mean, what's it mean for margins? Church and Dwight, they make toothpaste. Apple's not a real American it, company. No, it's not a real American no, company. It's some luxury stock thing. But to the rest of America out there making 4% revenue growth, I'm sorry, margin erosion could be tangible. Adenda, this was brilliant. Thanks for your time to break this down with us. Dana Peterson there of the conference board. Eric Najarian of UBS warning, quote, given the fourth quarter rally in the BKX and a sharp turn in sentiment heading into this year, we think January earnings season may present a speed bump to the sector's recent momentum. Erica, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Erica, great to catch up with you. Let's go straight to it. What is it about this earnings, this group of earnings that you think might be that speed bump? It's really, to use um, James' term, a uh, rude awakening for earnings. So it, it's not necessarily about the absolute price level, and it's not necessarily about the absolute multiple on earnings, but it's that earnings aren't going to go up. You know, as a reminder to everybody, what happened in the rally is we priced out a negative, and that negative was the unrealized bond losses on bond portfolios as Treasury yields were shooting higher. And so now we've removed that negative. But keep in mind that banks are actually positively rate sensitive. What that means, Tom, um, what that means, Jonathan, is that, you know, if the Fed is cutting rates, then you actually will have pressure on net interest income, especially in the front half, uh, half of the cuts. Erica, I'm looking at your coverage of the big banks, and I want to ask you about bank you don't cover, which I know is out of bounds, but I think it's really germane right now. Do you perceive the divide between 20 or 30 big banks and everybody else out there and the concern that the smaller banks of America are not in rude good health? They may not be as strong as the top 20 banks. But I think if the forward curve pans out, they will get a lot of relief in two ways. One, they'll get relief in deposit costs. And I think what you have seen in 2023 is a nice run up in deposit costs as the Fed tighten. And so they'll get relief on the funding side. Mm -hmm. The other piece of relief that those smaller banks will get is on commercial real estate. So commercial real estate is a more widely held at those smaller banks than they are on those larger banks that you mentioned, Tom. And, uh, you know, as such, you know, if interest rates are coming down, that could right. actually narrow the, the, the subset of potential problems as we deal with commercial real estate maturities ahead. And so to translate this to the rescue will be a lower money market yield where billions flows out of money market funds back to a more normal banking economy. Is that right? Correct. So I love that you hit on that. Not only will you get relief in deposit costs, but you also get that deposit flow back. So you're no yeah. longer having to, as an alternative, you know, either, you know, borrow wholesale at, you know, pretty much Fed funds or really ratchet up what you're offering your deposit customers. Erica, what is your top pick right now going into earnings season? I know you think it might be a difficult moment, a difficult rocky patch, but ultimately what is the top pick? So in a difficult moment, in a rocky patch, who does the market turn to? JP Morgan. So as I think about the expectations that are now into the market, and as I think about the enthusiasm about, you know, having these cuts without a recession, the bank that can deliver on earnings, the bank where we're most confident those earnings expectations can be delivered is JP Morgan. Okay, I mean, JP Morgan's out. What's it up? It's like Nvidia. It's like the Nvidia uh, of the not financial quite, system. Relatively speaking, compared to some regional. You're, you're telling me that after <laughs> massive double-digit return here, complete outperformance, that vector just keeps on going, Erica, for Mr. Diamond. I think so. So a, a couple of um, other data points. So from the October bottom in the BKX, 
JP Morgan has actually underperformed by eight percentage points. And remember what I said at the top of this segment, I said, it's not really about the, you know, absolute price. It's not about the PE, it's about the E. I think that the, you know, involvement in the space today is in hedge funds and in macro funds. You know, how long only will actually step in and move their weight in banks is they feel more confident that the E is not just bottom, but there is good news upside potential to right. the E. And again, just going back to JP Morgan, I think they're just in best position to deliver that. You know, and so their performance can mm-hmm. absolutely continue from here. Do we see mergers this year? I've been waiting 25 years for the roll up here, not to get to where Canada is, but you know, we got, what's the number? 4,000 banks, 5,000 banks. How do we cut that in half? Is it, this is the year that happens? I don't think so, because it's an election year. So there is um, there's a little bit of a mentality here, the seller's mentality that, oh, wow, I got the bond losses back in my capital as rates have come down. And now they're thinking about what the forward curve is implying and saying, OK, my my book value recovery is going to be X. X higher at the end of the year. And so I want a multiple off of that. Meanwhile, the buyers are like, um, absolutely not. And the other part of that, and I, since I mentioned the election, is that, you know, there has been a lot of consternation about the length of time between announcement and close. U.S. Bank Corp will tell you about that consternation. And so I think that, you know, Smart buyers may wait until we get more clarity on leadership before they think about wading into M&A. I want to weigh in on the politics if you can. You alluded to it there. It's 2024. It's election season. A client's asking about the regulatory backdrop going into next year off the back of who may or may not win the election this year. Is it still too early or is that something they're considering already? So it's something that they're saying it's too early to to price in, given the many variables that could happen between now and November. You know, that being said, they're thinking about, you know, the banks in, in a positive light if we did have a Republican administration. Of course, a lot of um, investors are asking me about the regulatory environment. And the thought process here is similar to 2016 uh, in that a change in administration from Democratic to Republican could potentially lead to regulatory easing, particularly now that we do have a proposal um, out there that everybody is hoping could be at least delayed, if not softened significantly. And so if you have an administration change and you don't have those cap rules finalized yet. There's a lot of hope of not just a significant delay, you know, but also um, a potential for reissuing, you know, that not that proposal in, in it with much, much, much less bite. And so that gives <clears throat> excuse me, that gives the market hope that all this capital that the banks are building up will be returned back to shareholders. You know, additionally, the banks are trading at a 48% relative PE to the the broad market, which I think is part of the current broad appeal. And as a reminder, the, the, the quote, Trump bump it, it, between 4, 4Q60 and 4Q17 was 75%. I think that's part of the thought process, you know, that the, the bulls are thinking about as they think about, you know, rate cuts and then a potential administration change. That's the big one to watch. The brilliant Erica Nigerian of UBS. Erica, thank Just you. Michael Collins briefs now, senior portfolio manager, debt at PGM. He watched every minute of Prudential's coverage of the Rose Bowl in the Michigan victory there a few days ago. Michael Collins, I'm going to look at the Rose Bowl here, the bond market. How will yield react off the CPI today? If we reaffirm disinflation, where across the yield curve will we see the biggest adjustment? Yeah, Tom, Jonathan, good morning. I'm I'm a big football fan, but I'm probably more excited about today's CPI print than I am the, the NFL playoff games this weekend, uh, to, to be honest with you. Tells you what a what a bond geek I am. But uh, I actually think the disinflation is is becoming more entrenched, mm-hmm. uh, Jonathan and Tom, notwithstanding, you know, the big jump in freight charges we've seen as a result of geopolitical risk. But you are seeing uh, more evidence that things like housing, are starting to 
uh, unravel a little bit. I think you're seeing more evidence of right. uh, the big surge in multifamily construction that is still to come online is going to cause rents to come down. Uh, so if you have housing at zero, you have goods already at zero or negative territory, even if services and wages get stuck in the fours, that puts average inflation in the mid twos, right? So I think right. you're on that trajectory and I think the Fed is, is ultimately going to have to play catch So up. do you model out, I haven't asked this question in ages, but, you know, I agree with you. And more importantly, Ed Yardeni uh, agrees with you on the surprises we, we may see in housing disinflation. What does it do to the 210 vanilla yield curve? I mean, right now we've been inverted since time began. And, you know, what do we, what do, we do? What, what, how does that react off of today's report? Yeah, I mean, the, the playbook, uh, as you know, Tom, is that the curve, you know, bull steepens. The front end uh, rallies more than the rest of the curve. That's, I think, what's in the cards over the intermediate term, meaning over the next year or two. Uh, in the next few months, though, if you're looking to trade this, I mean, it's really tough to be long kind of that, you know, two and three and four year part of the curve, because, as you know, there are a lot of rate cuts that are priced in. In the near term, starting you know as early as as in two months from now, uh, that may not come to fruition. I mean, the Fed is good at waiting and watching and and lagging, right? They lagged on the way up, and they are probably going to wait too long and keep rates too high for too long uh, before they cut, and then they're going to have to cut uh, more aggressively. So I think that's really uh, the the timing of of what's going to happen. But ultimately, in two years from now, uh, I think the curve will resume a more normal upward sloping shape. Michael, this is a little bit of a subtle shift from you. I've been following you for a long, long time. You know that. You haven't been super bearish, anything but. You've been constructive on certain parts of credit. I've noticed you've lightened up recently on credit exposure. Michael, can you tell us just exactly why and what's changed over the last few months? Is it price? Is it fundamentals? What is it? You know, it's, it's more price uh, than fundamentals, right? If you look at the fundamentals, I mean, the economy is actually doing great. It continues to surprise in terms of its resilience. I mean, it seems like the, the whole soft landing is happening, right? I mean, if you do have a recession and we have a 25% recession probability, which is elevated relative to you know historical averages, uh, but it's not going to be a hard landing, right? The probability of like this big, you know, existential credit crisis where defaults spike and, you know, consumer, consumers default and businesses go out is really, really low. You just don't have the leverage in the private sector to cause that that impetus. Right. So so I, I think that bodes well for fundamentals. I mean, but but credit fundamentals are deteriorating on the margin. They are definitely not in, not improving, but it's really the price, Jonathan. I mean, if you look at what's happened with with credit spreads, uh, they snapped in dramatically uh, through the end of last year, along with rates rallying, along right. with volatility coming down, along with, you know, stocks going up and they're kind of getting to the low end of their historical ranges in an environment where there's still a ton of economic and geopolitical uncertainty. So I think it's more, you know, be, be patient here, take some chips off the table, wait for better opportunities to, to reload on credit. So that is, does that mean clip the coupon as a general statement after a fairly robust 2023? Yeah, I think you clip the coupon and fixed income, you know, and I think you're still earning uh, attractive yields. I think interest rates across all sectors of fixed income are going to be lower uh, in a couple of years from now than they are today. So I think uh, you clip the coupon for now. Look right. for opportunities. If rates back up, you buy them. If credit spreads widen, you buy them. I think that's the world we're in. You have this right. Fed backstop, which you haven't had in a long time. With immense respect for PGM and all the awards you've won for total return, how do you and the team there frame the debacle of the last three years? Do you frame that someday we'll get back to where the Bloomberg total return index was in bond, that we will see true appreciation, or is that a time long gone? No, it's, it's a, we're, we're back, right, to where we were 20 years ago, Tom. You know, we look at, you know, beginning yields and, you know, the big index everybody in fixed income uses is your Bloomberg aggregate bond index, which is yielding, you know, 4.6%. And we are trying to beat that, right, by by one to two percent. So if you just kind of do that simple math, you're you're looking at you know mid you know mid plus single digit type of expected returns in high quality diversified fixed income. You know over the next 
five or 10 years, right? That's a, the, the beginning yield on high quality fixed income is a really good predictor of ultimate return. So the last 10 years is it really has been the lost decade in fixed income. It's been more than more than two or three. It's been, you know, returns in the in the really low single digits. Uh, but that's behind us, right? The, the forward looking view on fixed income is is much more constructive. Michael Collins, you are one of the absolute best over at P Jim. I love catching up with you. Mike Collins there at P Jim. Thanks for being with us, sir. big container shipping giants, the merchant ships, Tom, right. and not using the Red Sea as they were a month or so ago. Let's have a delicate conversation on this right now, and it's a conversation of geography and technology. Norman Rule, Senior Non-Resident Advisor for Transnational Threats Project at CSIS and working for America as a former senior U.S. intelligence official. Norman, I got eight ways to go, but when I look through the literature and the zeitgeist it's not like from Butch Cassidy, who are these guys? It's more, where are these guys? Where are the drones coming from? Where are the Houthi established geographically as they attack ships in the Red Sea? Good morning. Uh, Houthi forces and control is generally in the western portion of, of Yemen, which focuses on the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. There are not only missiles, drones, explosive boats and mine capabilities that must be monitored. Uh, but these, some of these capabilities are mobile. Uh, missile launchers are mobile. Drone sites can be trucks or, or, bar or barren fields. So this requires intensive and dynamic intelligence collection if one is to look at targeting uh, these facilities for military action. Do we do this alone or do we collect intelligence, particularly with the Houthi's great adversary, Saudi Arabia? The nature of U.S. intelligence collection for military operations in this scenario would likely be done by U.S. and British uh, and allied forces uh, who would be involved in any potential kinetic action. The Saudis would not be playing a role in kinetic action, so their, their involvement would be uh, limited, if any. And Norman, this is causing a massive disruption. I'm just wondering how cheap it is to cause this disruption. How sophisticated is the military arsenal of, say, the Houthi rebels? How sophisticated, how cheap is it? The military capabilities of the Houthis are uh, relatively sophisticated in terms of missiles, but this is an older technology. Iran has provided it. Iran has provided the training in Yemen and in Iran itself. And uh, in essence, when, I think when the military tends to look at these targets, there is the issue of a missile that costs so many thousands of dollars or a drone so many tens of dollars versus a $2 million anti-ballistic missile. But the idea of, well, what damage could that drone or Houthi missile cause really becomes part of that economic equation. Norman, U.S. forces and allies, the mere presence in the Red Sea is meant to act as a deterrent. It's not. They're now intercepting missiles. What happens if they fail to intercept one of those missiles? Have we given thought, Norman, I'm sure you have, as to what would happen next as a consequence? So I, I think it is fair to say that the U.S. and partner presence, uh, to include the United Kingdom, has shaped Houthi behavior and likely deterred some scale of their, of their action. This said, if a Houthi missile were to strike, say, the bridge of a container ship, and it were to sit in flames in the Gulf or to strike the bridge of a, of a tanker, or worse yet, to cause significant damage on an oil tanker, that would be dramatic. Significant, a significant oil leak in the uh, Red right. Sea would shut down all shipping. I mean, a, a really naive question, Norman, but I've got to go there. So a drone goes up in the air, and does a pro like you go, oh, we'll knock it down? I mean, is it like skeet shooting on a Sunday or, you know, the clay pigeons up there and you just nail that puppy? Or is it is it sort of blind luckish that we're knocking down these drones? Which is it? Well, I'm, I'm not a pro and I've not been involved in those angles, but it is not blind luck. This involves precision weaponry and a tremendous amount of training. And our NAVCENT yeah. and CENTCOM personnel go through a tremendous amount of, of, <clears throat> of, of training for this sort of event uh, throughout the year. So when we bring this forward, and let's take it back to the Secretary of State doing shuttle diplomacy, who does he want to talk to? to have a change agent for the Houthis. Does, does, does the secretary need to go to Tehran and begin a dialogue with, with people that we don't want to have a dialogue with? 
such a dialogue, which would be unadvised, un, 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 uh, injudicious, would have no impact on Iran's behavior. Iran's proxies throughout the region are following a consistent pattern of aggression against the United States and, and Israel. The United States does send messages indirectly to Iran through a variety of partners, people who have diplomatic relations with Tehran, but it has no effect and it's not anticipated to have any impact. Norman, ultimately what we're getting at here is what is the risk, the potential that this war could spread? As we know in the last week, and you and I talked about it, top Hamas official killed in Lebanon, that potentially was a source of escalation. It hasn't been so far. How do you think that is contained at the moment? How contained is the risk of a broader conflict? Well, there continue to be no strategic drivers for Iran or its proxies to engage in a conventional conflict or risk a wide range formal conflict because that threatens many of their domestic political and economic initiatives. At the same time, there are multiple reasons for Iran and its proxies to maintain the current level of violence and even escalate that level of violence as <clears throat> they've crossed red lines and some of the right. violence is normal. Norman, one final question. And, you know, we, we are thrilled with your commitment to surveillance. You've really come on since day one here and given us perspective. This seems to be deteriorating. Away from the media coverage, the immediacy of images in Gaza and all, is that correct in Washington among institutions, including your CIA? Is this a deteriorating situation? I would say it's an evolving situation, and it's evolving somewhat predictably. In the absence of deterrent action against Iran and its proxies, they're continuing to maintain some sort of an approach to upset the regional security. Here's your worry. If we undertake a two-state solution, diplomatic effort, do we expect Iran and its proxies to stand by while Palestinian relations with Israel are normalized? That's unlikely. So I don't see that there's been sufficient diplomatic effort by the international community to say, how do we constrain Iran and its proxies from upsetting peace in the region? So true. Norman, thank you, sir, for your input this morning. Norman Rule there of CSIS, a former <coughs> senior U.S. intelligence official. Subscribe to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live every weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can watch us live on Bloomberg Television and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Keen, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.